Thanks. Awesome, guys. Great stuff. Glad to be here on a Saturday uh, Saturday morning. And uh, yeah, excited to talk about uh, uh, APIs and API security here. So um, excellent. Let's go and get started. A little bit more about myself. Um, I've been in security now for about 15 years. Uh, I always say that I got uh, my start with uh, WinNuke 95, and I know that starts to that's starting to age me a little bit. But those were fun times with uh, some early operating systems. Originally from Pennsylvania, been in Salt Lake City since 2001, so uh, easily uh, over half my life, and now live in Lehigh. I've traveled significantly for work and uh, cover now most of the Southwest areas, uh, thing, uh, security solutions in those in those regions and those cities. But uh, most of the time, most Saturdays, uh, most weekend nights and weeknights, you'll see me on a soccer field or at least carpooling soccer kids around uh, the valley. So it's, um, I always say that's my real job. But let's go ahead and let's get into it. I'm excited to really highlight here some of um, the new things that we're seeing uh, with APIs and, and a new, really a new attack surface that more and more enterprises uh, are leveraging. And it's really been um, a good, a good you know, change of pace. I've, I've spent 10 years in application security uh, specifically dealing with uh, web application firewalls, uh, application attacks, um, securing login pages, and dealing with the ever-increasing uh, attack surface that we have with uh, credential stuffing and account takeover, and uh, you know breaches with uh, you know uh, in that in that sense, right? So securing login pages and things has been something I've been doing a lot with lately. Um, but, you know, APIs are causing a change in how applications um, are secured, should be secured, uh, and how we're, uh, you know, businesses are really implementing uh, web pages going forward. And so when you think about traditional application security, the solutions out there that most of us are familiar with, or at least are pretty common uh, in industry, are, are, are like a WAF, so Web Application Firewall. Uh, you're going to have something like Palo Alto, which is like a next generation firewall. Um, things like that that are looking to um, secure uh, applications from the common attacks that we have. Uh, the OWASP Foundation for a couple of years now has been releasing uh, their top 10 of application security attacks. And, we're, and those are pretty well familiar. Um, but they don't cover the change that we see with APIs. Um, the attack vectors that face um, API-driven websites are different than the attack vectors that would come against a traditional web application. And so to give a little bit of history on APIs and kind of how we got here is when you think back to what was one of the very first um, really large popular e-commerce sites that we had in eBay. And now I don't shop too much on eBay anymore, but you know, we go back to uh, the beginnings of eBay, you would sit there, uh, you, you have this auction site, you're, you're watching your bid to see if someone is going to outbid you in that, in that last 60 seconds or 30 seconds of a bid. And eBay needed a way that they could communicate that real-time auction, those bid numbers as they changed uh, quickly, you know, rapidly. And they couldn't refresh the entire web page and expect that that bid or your screen to have the new information right away. And so eBay came out with really the first web API where uh, the API would just request and it would just update the price, what the bid, what the new bid is on that web page. And it wouldn't reload all of the HTML and, and process the entire page. And now we can continue to see that today. A, pop, a popular example for me is on, our, is on the ESPN sites, where if you're following a play-by-play -play of a basketball game or a football score, uh, ESPN is not refreshing the entire page all the time. It's just that simple play-by-play -play information that the API is processing. And so those are the differences. That's how we see web applications moving now. Uh, we're getting away from, uh, you know, the traditional website where it's a, a massive request. 
you have a, a large web, web server that is processing that and feeding that out um, each time to where now it's more real-time data and it's just the data that's important to the web page. Um, and we kind of refer to these, you can refer to these as single page applications. Another good example is, is Netflix, where you can almost endlessly scroll and then Netflix will display the new recommendations whenever that comes into your field of view. And so to do this right now, uh, we're move, moving on to what we refer to as a micro architecture with APIs, where each API microservice will just reply to that specific API call that's being requested. So this could just be the authentication page to your application. It could just be the real-time game score. In Netflix's world, it could just be you know, the top 10 recommendations. It could be your action movie, movie recommendations. But each microservice handles a different part of the web page. So this allows to have faster real-time responses to the content that the users are, are, are looking for, are expecting to see in, the, in their browser window, in their application. Um, and it also obviously then allows the service in a microservice world to expand more rapidly. If a certain aspect of the web page is busier than, than the other, then that microservice can expand or shrink in your cloud availability set to cope for the load of just that particular aspect of your web page, and you're not duplicating the entire site to handle just a small aspect of your web page. So that's what's bringing us up to date here with uh, APIs. And so now, when we look at the different architectures, the different requirements around API security, uh, the OWASP Foundation came together and created a specific top 10 list of vulnerabilities um, that we see specifically on API endpoints and API applications. And so when we look at these, we, we see here some clean distinctions between uh, the traditional vulnerabilities on uh, application security. We do see a few holdovers uh, down here at the bottom, around seven to 10. Um, those we've seen before in the past and are, and are common across applications, and we'll speak to that. Um, but the top six here are very unique, and uh, we'll get into some of the uniqueness of these. But ultimately, it comes down to the fact that we're getting away from what we refer to in the industry as signature protection or attack signatures. Uh, in a web application firewall space, and one thing I became very familiar with in the beginning of my career was the concept of attack signature. And a common example of that will be if I'm running a web server, an Apache web server, and the Apache web server has a vulnerability, then anybody running that version of Apache is going to be, can potentially be vulnerable. And so an attacker can create a common attack string, if you will, that would um, exploit the Apache vulnerability. And so from a security solution perspective, I would just need to write a specific signature that looked for that attack string. I could push it out across my solutions. I could create it once. And, uh, you know, then the, in all intents and purposes, that attack would be mitigated. And from an attacker perspective, it was also pretty easy. He could craft that specific attack string blast it out across the internet. Anybody running that version of Apache or that version of the web server could potentially be vulnerable and I would have my attack and I could attack anybody running that string and, and I'm successful. In the API world, these APIs, um, one, are, are more customized. Uh, there's no such thing as a common API implementation. Every business, uh, every website is going to have some type of a Im implementation specific to their needs and to their development, to their DevOps practices and their developers, how they coded their API. So there isn't a, a necessarily a common uh, signature that I can just blast out and that everything would um, then work. There has to be a level of reconnaissance that an attacker does to discover these vulnerabilities, to profile the APIs. And so that, that entails as well a different type of security. We can't just put 
an API endpoint behind a WAF, an application firewall, and expect all of those signatures to take effect or to have um, you know, the type of security that we're used to. Uh, oftentimes, APIs as well, uh, we can assume that these APIs are going to be accessed uh, through a browser. So things like browser security as well doesn't necessarily apply. Um, in my experience, as soon as you know, one of my customers put uh, an API endpoint behind an application firewall, I quickly saw that nearly you know, 20 to 30 percent of the security policies um, or features would apply. They would lose 70 percent of the value that a WAF could do because bot detection, um, you know, browser telemetry, uh, you know, the things that a WAF would do to run, in, run inside the browser to detect and identify the attacker can't happen because the API is either it's a business, you know, it's a machine to machine communication, or it's a native mobile application where we can't run those things inside a browser because the browser doesn't exist. And so you lose those protections. And the top six here that we see, broken object level authorization, broken authentication, all the way down here to mass assignment, these are things that um, are not going to be covered with those traditional solutions. And so let's look at why that is. And we'll dive into a little bit deeper on, on these here. So the first one, the most common one, being a broken object level authorization attack. I'm going to highlight two specific attacks. Um, where this affected some very large customers. And really what it boils down to is once I am authenticated as a legitimate user, what does that authorization, what does my authentication allow me to do? And in often cases, what we're gonna see here is that allows me then to, uh, to access data of another user. So there's, I'm authenticated and the API is doing the authentication check but it's not checking what I'm authorized to see, whether or not I have permissions to see this data. I'm authenticated to the system, and once I'm authenticated, I can get whatever I want. And this is a very difficult uh, from a DevOps perspective because you have to do this check basically on every request that the authenticated user uh, is making. So when we look here, here's one example. This is from last July as when it was detected, but specifically uh, was disclosed around November where an attacker, once he was authenticated to, um, you know, the Verizon basically customer portal here, he was uh, able to access then or just uh, enumerate all the contract IDs as part of that API request and returned roughly 2 million um, contracts or account uh, account agreements here uh, from the Verizon um, system here and uh, pretty obviously pretty uh, significant um, and it really wasn't that difficult here so what all the main thing here is we'll get into how somebody like this can get um, this information the steps that an attacker would do uh, if he wants to uh, begin to attack some of these APIs um, but it wasn't that difficult from his perspective. And, a, and an attacker, one of their first things they will do is they will go through any type of a user creation process and get a valid account. And from that perspective, once they have a valid account, they get some more information and they can begin to um, see what, that, um, what their authentication gives them, what their account permissions allow them to do. And in this case, he was able to return uh, multiple agreements. Um, another scenario here, and this was a little bit older, a little bit, um, maybe about two years ago now in 2018, but this was when the United States Postal Service first pushed out their, you know, track your package. Um, they're referred to as their informed visibility system. This is a terrible rollout, gave out tons of, uh, this wasn't the only vulnerability that was detected against this application when it was first released. But in this case here is very simple. The flaw allowed any user logged in to the system to use an API to see account details for other users. And um, so very simple here. And as, you, as we can see, or as we will see when we get into this, um, 
this isn't a this isn't a situation where we're looking at I'll come back to the screen here. This isn't a situation where we're looking at um, a traditional attack signature. There's no um, there's no malicious content here from a traditional perspective that would say the attack uh, request is incorrect or is bad. It's not malformed. It's a valid uh, API request. Um, everything, there's no parameters that were inserted here, um, but it's down to the actual value level uh, of the parameters that is the mistake here. And so this would easily bypass any type of application firewall rule. Um, you know, there's other solutions out there that are, you know, doing some like blacklisting and whitelisting of, um, of traffic of, of API requests, but there's nothing wrong here in the request. Um, you have to compare um, the actual value that is in um, the cookie or is in the um, token um, against what is being requested. And so is the user ID here that is in the request, does that match the user ID that's in the response? Uh, and if it doesn't, then that's something that we have to look at. And so it's down to the actual parameter value level of how we would have to compare multiple values in the request and in the response from a security perspective. And so very difficult, uh, difficult one to, uh, to remediate. Okay, so the next one we have here was on A2, um, broken authentication. Broken authentication can really highlight any type of credential stuffing or account takeover um, issue here against um, any type of API login endpoint. Uh, I see my time, so I'm gonna go a little bit faster here. But what we have here is, uh, you know, basically uh, Java, web, uh, Java web tokens are becoming more and more popular, if not the one of the main ways that APIs handle the authentication. Be aware, um, it's not necessarily, um, super secure, there's, there's definitely vulnerabilities out there in how that is handled. Um, you know, it's not difficult for an attacker to um, decrypt or to open up what's inside that token and look for uh, sensitive data or vulnerabilities as to how they could then um, break an authentication. Uh, the one thing as well is oftentimes businesses will have um, their standard form-based authentication in their traditional application and then they're gonna have multiple, possibly multiple API endpoints that handle authentication. And so as businesses move away from, you know, one form of authentication to another, there is multiple ways, you know, or multiple doors now where authentication takes place. And so um, the API endpoints may not always follow um, in the same visibility or it may not be integrated into additional security solutions like the traditional um, login pages are in the beginning. So be aware of that. Now this is a good one here, excessive data exposure. I don't know if it's any attack is good, but um, plenty of good examples of how this happens. And when we think of uh, data exposure, right away we think of, you know, a database breach, where somebody exfiltrated uh, millions of rows from um, a database through a traditional maybe application SQL injection, they got inside the business, uh, whatever it is. But in the API world, this really has a different connotation, it's a different meaning. It's not about getting data from the database, but it's about exposing sensitive data where it wasn't required. And this is an example that the OWASP uh, gave, which isn't good. There's plenty of dating apps out there. Um, and this was a case where uh, just through a simple request, um, you know, even if I turned, in this example here, even if I turn my privacy settings on, meaning that I don't want my location to be shared in the application, all that privacy setting did was remove those fields from the user interface, from the application. It did not prevent the server, the server from responding with that data. So in this case here, I simply would 
You know, if I, I put my privacy settings on, okay, great, my data is not shared. Well, that's not the case. If we actually look at what is included in the response, my latitude and longitude is still there. Even if I wanted to hide my photo, I don't want to share my photo. That's okay either because the actual URI, the URL to my photo is included in the response still. So it's, it's just hidden in the interface. It's not, you know, preventing that data from being returned. And so you can kind of refer to this as client-side filtering, which is not actually preventing my data from being exfiltrated. And so this is an example of what in the API world, excessive data exposure means. And from an attacker perspective, if I wanted to take this a step further and just, you know, <laughs> continue to friend people, find their location, we even saw here during this attack, you know, they were able to get down to and say, hey, there's even people using this application, you know, supposedly in the White House. Now somebody could be spoofing this location or whatever, but you get the idea. All right. So in this scenario, um, so from a, a remediation perspective, you also want to have something that is investigating the response uh, data in APIs. We can see the difference here. Um, from a traditional perspective, the traditional security tools like a WAF are only inspecting uh, on the request and not inspecting the response. When you look at API security, you have to look at the response as well as what you're sending out. Uh, resources and rate limiting. This is another one here. So we have things like, um, you know, this isn't about networking. When I came into the API space, I had to kind of change my thinking a little bit where, you know, in the, in the, you, you think about the network requesting or limiting the requests uh, coming from the network side, from the IP side. Here again, this is more about the response. How much data am I trying to return from these microservices? You will see very commonly we have, you know, a page size. We're only going to return 250 items. Remember, these microservices are usually a lot smaller implementations, a lot smaller servers, where it could be very, you know, it's very possible to overload those. Um, so you're not going to cause, you know, not, not looking to take down the entire website. You're just looking to cause the microservice to return too much data to where it can't handle processing all of the data that's being returned. So we have to do checks here on exactly you know, what the page size value should be. And then get notice here, it's a, it's a completely legitimate request. The attack here is that I'm increasing this value to a size where the microservice can't handle it, I'm gonna crash it. Uh, the other thing here, broken function level authorization. Now what we're talking about is changing uh, you know, the actual method calls. So the post, you know, I'm supposed to, this API endpoint expects maybe a post to be received from an attacker perspective. What if I change that to delete? What if I change from a, you know, post to a put? Um, is there checking involved there that the server won't either as well process an incorrect method call to that endpoint? Um, and this is very common. I see this is a first level from an attacker perspective. As they're, as they're looking through the API endpoints, what, what, can they, what can they access, what can they hit? Next is mass assignment. Can I change you know, the, um, my permission level by including additional fields? All right, so maybe I'm authenticated as a user. I'm gonna go through, create my user account. I now have a, just a basic user account, and now I wanna elevate my privileges on the API. You know, can I do that? And this is a very common, I see this a lot as well. You know, if you know, is admin equals true, change my role to administrator, all trying to find elevated privileges that then gives them access to additional, additional endpoints or additional permissions to request data. Um, this was an example that I saw here <laughs> uh, just recently where um, during the registration process, 
you know, uh, they can detect here in the beginning, I'm trying to register my email. The response is, nope, email is not verified. That's an incorrect email. We changed that. And so the attacker just saw that response and said, oh, well, I wonder if in my response, I tell it that it's verified. He did that, came back, and now the email is verified. Um, so this is an example here of doing that mass assignment. It's not so much on the roles, but we can still get through here. Basically, what you can do is include the parameter or uh, insert additional parameters that aren't in um, the standard request that we see, but just modify it a little bit and you get what you want. Uh, security misconfiguration. Now, now we're getting to some of the ones uh, from the traditional OWASP top 10. But here, this is simply when uh, we, we can cause an error or in the response, uh, you're basically leaking um, data that helps the, helps the attacker understand what the process is or understand what you know, services are running, and then they can maybe craft specific attacks against that. Uh, we still have injection attacks here. And what's interesting and what I've seen is that um, just because the traditional application has, you know, all your traditional applications are behind a WAF, you know, the SQL injection and the cross-site scripting attacks aren't as prevalent. But how about your API endpoints? Because, you know, those are created maybe ad hoc, maybe they're in different environments, um, they're created more, you know, frequently, there's rapid development in the API space. So those API endpoints aren't behind uh, the traditional security solutions that we have, leaves them available for these injection attacks. And maybe, you know, from a cross-site script perspective, you're inserting something that then has, takes a hold on, on the website side as well. Uh, I've seen it as well. So it's like, you know, the website's more secure, but the API endpoint that's on that website is not. And so I can access that and have almost like a side load into um, the website. Uh, now, improper asset management, and the last ones here, as I'm running out of time, are all about the traditional approaches. We still see these a lot. But basically, uh, you know, the APIs are, are definitely a, a newer space. Security teams don't have the same amount of visibility or just haven't been provided that in the business. And so for the security team to discover and identify these APIs, uh, is more difficult. And so you need something you know, outside of just, you know, good um, documentation practices to discover and identify your API landscape and how, you know, how big that grows. Um, the other thing I've noticed, um, and I'm sure we've seen this as well, is APIs have versions. So you'll push out a new version of your API, one, two, three, four, uh, there was a time I was working, um, you know, integrating with Salesforce. I think at that time, they were on version like uh, 38 or 39 of their API. But the version I needed was version 27, because that's one that was compatible with the solution I was deploying. And I could go back and just change the version number in the URI and get back to version 27. And that's what we see here as well. So in proper asset management, you're promoting these APIs, and uh, the old ones are not getting depermissioned. And so you still have exposure uh, to those APIs that haven't been updated. So I'm going to pause there, um, answering the questions that might be out there. No worries. So good. Um, Cool. Well, guys, I, I hope that was beneficial. Um, I want to give time to rotate onto the next one. My time is about up. Uh, you can find me out there on Slack and anywhere else. And I'll answer any questions you have. Appreciate your time and look forward to uh, the rest of the conference.